public administrations are striving hard to have state-of-the-art ICT systems supporting efficient services for citizens and businesses. Within the European Union, we travel, study and do business across countries. Therefore, there's a need for common and interoperable e-government solutions in Europe. However, most countries have built their national e-systems separately. And sometimes it doesn't work. How can we build an interoperable Europe? Firstly, we need to make sure that machines can talk to each other by using interoperable software. Otherwise, Secondly, we need syntactical and semantic conventions. That means we need to agree on the language and the format to use to exchange information and to translate it automatically. Otherwise, <sighs> and finally, we should follow the same rules. Otherwise, If we join forces on these three levels, we achieve the harmonious collaboration we're looking for. An interoperable Europe. Interested? APR doesn't stand for astronauts piloting rickshaws. It stands for annual percentage rate, which calculates the total interest you'll pay over the entirety of your loan, including any additional fees. When you know exactly what you're getting into, it's easy to get into a Ford. In today's volatile foreign exchange market, we need to work harder to protect against currency fluctuations. At AFEX, we do the hard work for you. By understanding where your exposure lies, we will create a tailor-made strategy to fit your needs. Our customized solutions are designed to take the uncertainty out of your global payments so that you can stay focused on the road ahead. Call our team today for a free risk management consultation. By 2020, rapid growth markets will account for 50% of global GDP, will be responsible for 38% of world consumer spending and 55% of world fixed capital investment. New markets mean new opportunities and new challenges. New challenges don't have to be scary. With the right information and the right guide, finding the right opportunity becomes much easier. Ernst & Young can help your business navigate through these new markets because our people are there, making connections and doing business in over 140 countries. So you can benefit from this, we've brought this global knowledge together in our innovative Emerging Market Center. Ernst & Young's Emerging Market Center gives you access to a dedicated team of experienced professionals with local insights, local contacts and global knowledge. As a hub, you can tap into the latest market information, trends and identify opportunities to suit your business. You can access in-depth analysis, reports, and use our dynamic tools to give your business that essential know-how that's needed to cross borders. So next time you go to market, make sure you go to emergingmarkets.ey.com first. It's your connection to the world's fastest growing markets. At the end of communism, we had, you know, a feeling that sort of rights and choices were finally secured to us and that suddenly a possibility of social change might happen. But today there is less and less of a feeling that choice is actually related to social change. There has been 
a lot of current debates in the domain of psychology, behavioral economics, and so on, why we feel so overwhelmed in front of choices. And every one of you probably has had the same experience of going into a supermarket and just being, you know, horrified by the choices. So psychologists, of course, have seen that overwhelming choice creates the feeling of anxiety in regard to what do I really want. But it also sort of in some way pacifies people. People are quite often frozen in some kind of a state of undecisiveness when there are too many choices. So what is happening on the level of society when we have an ideology which dominates the idea of choice at every level of our lives? That suddenly an idea of choice becomes in a way a domineering idea on which capitalism today is based, not only in regard to consumption, but in regard to perception of life as such. So I remember my law professor colleague, a very successful man, once told me that he is totally anxious to choose wine in a restaurant. He said, I'm afraid that people will laugh at me. If I choose too expensive one, I will appear as if I'm showing off. If I choose too cheap, I will look like I'm a cheapskate. So he always chooses something in the middle and insists on paying for it in order to appease the anxiety and the guilt in regard to this choice. Now, when we say that we are afraid that other people will laugh at us in regard to our choices, we invoke the need to be somehow regarded by others and also to be sort of perceived by society as such, what in Lacanian psychoanalysis is called big other in a particular way. So choices are anxiety provoking for a couple of reasons. First, we never make simply an individual choice. It's not simply us as individuals outside of society making choices, but quite often we choose what other people are choosing or we are obsessed with how will others regard us in regard to our choice. So that's one anxiety-provoking thing about choice, that it's a very you know, social matter. Now, the second anxiety-provoking think about choices today is that we try to make an ideal choice, which is why people are constantly, for example, switching telephone providers or, you know, going from one partner to another and always feel dissatisfied. You know, the third most important thing about choice is that choice always involves a loss. So when I choose one direction in life, I lose the possibility of another. And dealing with loss is something that is highly anxiety-provoking today. And, of course, at the end, the loss, which we ha all have to face where there is no choice, is death. But even with that, we try to sort of mastermind it, prolong it, try ways to control death, and so on. There is also a very important another layer of anxiety which operates in the way choice is presented in society. And here I touch the issue of ideology. Now, in socialism, especially in Yugoslavia, where I was raised, no one believed in communist ideal. Even party apparatchiks never read Marx or Lenin. It was actually quite dangerous to read them. So the belief in ideology of communism was something people innerly didn't internalize. But then nonetheless, a certain logic of belief functioned, the idea that People quite often do not believe in something, but they pretend as if they are believing in order not to offend the idea that other people might believe in it. Or in socialism, let's say no one believed in communism, but no one sort of uttered it with the exception of some intellectual dissidents openly because they believed in the belief of others or an idealized big other which supposedly holds society together. Now, today, this belief in belief still very much functions. Let, let us look at today's perception of sexuality. Uh, not long ago, a British journalist wrote an essay in which he described honestly that his sex life is pretty boring. He said, when I compare my sex life with what's written in Cosmopolitan magazine or other men magazine, how it should be, 
what are the enjoyments out there possible. I am embarrassed to admit to anyone that I have never come close to those enjoyments depicted, and which is why I keep this secret to myself. But nonetheless, when one does not sort of utter it publicly, we sort of create a belief in the belief that sexuality can be something full of, you know, fantastic experiences. Now, similarly, today we have an ideology, especially this ideology of choice, which forces us to perceive ourselves being guilty for the failures in our life, especially our professional life. Now, this, if you lose a job, you will first blame yourself, not the corporation which fired you. We also feel ashamed for being poor. If even a decades ago there was some kind of identification with being a working class, now it's more the feeling of inadequacy, of not making it. Now, ideology of capitalism, fr from the beginning, capitalized on the idea that everyone can make it. And the idea of self-made man was the cornerstone of this ideology. But today, this idea of self-making has been pushed to its utter limits. So the idea that everyone can become a celebrity, everyone can make it, it very much dominates today's society. Now, especially the celebrity thing is very interesting because, you know, in the past, people would sort of want to be famous for something, for doing something, for having some education or some special skills. Now it's to be famous for just being, you know. It does, you don't need to be anything else but, you know, contested in Big Brother or whatever. So psychoanalysis, of course, has been observing these changes in the society and also in the individual. And what interests me is to bring them together. Now, Freud pointed out that malaise in civilization and the malaise of individual always go together. So one influences the other. Capitalism is actually creating some kind of a subjectivity which starts, in a way, ruining him or herself. Capitalism is a system which functions quicker and quicker. We work longer hours, we are rushing around, and we are constantly consuming. But at some point, this subject starts believing that he is not simply a proletarian slave, but that he is a master, that he is in charge of his life. And that's a very important ideological turn, which sort of allows, you know, the system to go on and creates more and more, let's say, kind of a submission on the side of people, the belief that you are actually in charge, although you aren't. It's a very important belief. Also that more and more this overworked subject starts not not only consuming constantly around him, but also consuming him or herself, which is why bulimia, anorexia, workaholism, various addictions become so prevalent in today's society. So the turn sort of to oneself, the self-criticism, feeling guilty for one's failure, anxiety over choices, and various new symptoms were, you know, guiding me in looking at why ideology of choice is actually not so optimistic ideology and why it actually prevents social change. Now, the political problem, why there is such a lack of social changes happening today. Some sociologists who have looked at this matter realize that sometimes this fear is related again with loss. Now, we might have a little, you know, we might have a small job, a little pension or whatever. And, you know, when you have a little, you might be so much more afraid to lose even that little which you have, which is why you do not stick your neck out and you don't sort of provoke social change or try to organize yourself in, that would provoke social change. So today the problem is actually, for me, that today's ideology of you know, choice, late capitalism, idea that everyone is a maker of his or her life, which goes very much against the reality of social situation, actually pacifies people and makes us constantly turning criticism to ourselves instead of organizing ourselves and making a critique of society we live in.